Today we will review the third of the basic disciplines with which we will be working, data science. The science of data naturally deals with data, so let's first delve into some definitions related to data. More specifically, we will be talking about digital data, i.e. data that has already been captured and digitalized, or that we are producing directly in a digital format. The types of data we'll be dealing with are varied and heterogeneous. Probably the first examples that come to mind are sequences, such as DNA and protein sequences, and counts, such as sequencing read counts and species counts. And it is true that we'll be primarily dealing with these two types of data and different transformations thereof. However, there are many other types of data we manipulate and use all the time in molecular data analysis and often overlook. For example, ontologies. When we use functional annotations of proteins or when we use taxonomic classifications, we are using ontologies, controlled vocabularies with well-defined meanings and relationships. We also use structured data. Notably, well-curated 16S alignments almost always use secondary structure, while many protein annotations are informed by tertiary structure, even if these are often only inferred from sequence data. When we record data about our samples, we also use spatial and temporal data. Where and when did I take my sample? And from this, we can retrieve geographic data when relevant. We can further characterize our samples through the measurement of physicochemical parameters, and we can also collect relevant direct microscopic observations that might inform our analysis, such as cell counts and morphology. We also use networks very often. When we implicitly or explicitly model interactions among microbes, or between microbes and their hosts or their environment, or when we use phylogeny, note that trees which are still the primary way in which we represent phylogenies, are a type of network. And a last example, we use literature. Not only the structured data we obtain from literature, but also the trove of unstructured data we regularly sift through when we read manuscripts or watch talks and lectures. These are all types of data we regularly encounter in molecular data analysis, sometimes without even realizing. However, we often make this distinction between our primary data and this catch-all concept of metadata. So, what's the distinction between data and metadata? Not much, really. And it's always context-dependent. Essentially, data is the primary nugget of information with which we are concerned in our research question. And metadata is data about that data. For example, think about physicochemical parameters and geography. These are often dubbed metadata, because they are data about my samples. But for a study dealing with biochemistry or geography, these are the central data. Another common example is DNA sequences and sequence quality. Which one is data and which one is metadata? Well, that depends. If my question is what's the sequence of a DNA molecule, then the data is the sequence itself. The quality simply serves as data about my data to inform me on how confident I can be at every position. However, if my question is about the distribution of sequence quality scores, then my data is the quality. The sequence is important data about my data, perhaps telling me that low quality scores are more likely in certain nucleotides, but it's not at the core of my question, so I will consider it as metadata. And this brings up a very important concept in data science, data quality. We should always be aware of the quality of our data. Maybe we cannot always quantify the quality, but we should always have an objective sense for it. For example, when we read literature, we should read critically and check sources to assess the quality of the data we gather from it. We should also run negative controls and positive controls in different ranges whenever possible in any instruments we use to have a sense of the quality of the measurements. And yes, that very much includes bioinformatic instruments. Importantly, there are several ways in which data can be faulty, so we need to make distinctions between types of quality. Let's begin by making the distinction between precision and accuracy. A popular way of representing these concepts is with a target practice. In this case, 
we are evaluating three instruments. The first instrument is highly reproducible. It generates very similar results under similar conditions. That means it is very precise, even if it doesn't really hit the bullseye. The second instrument, on the other hand, tends to produce measurements very close to the actual target. This means it's very accurate. However, notice that it has a greater spread. Finally, the third instrument is highly reproducible and it also generates measurements very close to the target, so it is both precise and accurate. Another way to think about these concepts is with a scatter plot comparing the actual values of a parameter and the corresponding observed measurements. Here we have measurements that are highly reproducible since they strongly depend on the condition, so these are precise measurements. Here, on the other hand, we have values that actually resemble the real value of the parameter, so these are accurate measurements. Finally, here we have values that resemble the actual values but also have a very small spread, so they are both precise and accurate measurements. These concepts are very important because when we analyze data, we must always consider the quality of said data. For example, let's go back to the DNA sequence we saw before. This sequence is the result of an instrument measurement derived from an actual sequence encoded in a real molecule. And we have a quality measurement for each observation, in this case for each nucleotide. In this example, the actual sequence is of very low quality since it has a 30% error rate. However, note that the quality metric is very good since it really predicts the probability of observing an error. Armed with this quality information, we can actually use this data while qualifying any results by the probability of errors we have estimated. Without any quality information, this data is nearly worthless since we cannot know to what extent it can be trusted. Therefore, it is of the utmost importance that we always study our data in conjunction with a metric of incertitude. This could be quality scores or indexes, often expressed as a function of the probability of error, but it can also be error bars, which graphically represent the standard error of a single continuous measurement. Or the two-dimensional cousins, the error bands, which represent the expected error in a given correlation between continuous variables. Also, it's hard to precisely quantify the quality of some data, but qualitative information is also of great value, so describing potential or known biases goes a long way. Importantly, most point measurements are actually derived from samples. This means that we generally use data to infer something about a much larger, unobserved set. But how well a sample represents the whole thing? This is where we need to concern ourselves with the concept of coverage. Coverage, as defined by Good and Turing, is the proportion of the population represented by the sample. Note that population here is taken in the statistical sense of the complete set being sampled, not in the ecological sense. Chow and Just offer a rewording that might be a little clearer specific to biological samples. Coverage is a measure of sample completeness, the proportion of the total number of individuals in a community that belong to the species represented in the sample. This definition separates two aspects of coverage, the completeness measure and the category definition. The former is the fraction that can be characterized by a given categorization of the data, and the latter defines the resolution of that categorization. Let's see an example. Here we have a natural environment hosting individuals from four different species. If we take the sample represented here by a black circle, how can we calculate the coverage of that sample? This is the rank abundance plot of the four observed species in our community. Since we observed the three most abundant species in our sample, we have observed species representing 96% of all individuals. The only species we didn't observe was the dragon, corresponding to one individual, or around 4% of the community. Importantly, this value is tied to our categorization of species. If we wanted to increase the resolution and make distinctions between the subspecies of different hues, we would consider many more categories. In our example, we sampled many monkeys, but the rare teal and green subspecies eluded our sampling. Also, we did sample blue and yellow unicorns, but not the pink ones. 
the subspecies coverage is only 75%, since the observed subspecies account for only 21 individuals out of 28. Think about the consequences of increasing or decreasing resolution. Is the coverage of a given sample always lower when we increase resolution? Pause the video, ponder for a moment, and discuss your conclusions. We also have to note that sample coverage is abundance-weighted average coverage. For example, we observe 3 out of 4 species, or 75% species observed. This is not the sample coverage, but it's sometimes also reported and it's very important for some applications. Similarly, we have sampled 15 out of 28 individuals, or 54% individuals observed. Again, this is not sample coverage, but it's also important for some applications, such as census data. Now, how do we design and plan data collection? There are many important considerations on data collection. For example, a classical problem is how to ensure randomized sampling, so our sample faithfully represents the population. Another consideration we might have is blinding. Originally popularized in medical trials, single or double blind data analysis is actually a very powerful technique to reduce researcher bias. In the specific case of human subjects, we may also have privacy concerns. And another consideration of note is the selection and inclusion of controls, as we discussed earlier, as well as the sample size. All of these are important aspects, and I'm leaving many other important ones out for now. However, let us focus on that last one for a moment, sample size. In order to decide how much should I sample, we need to make a distinction between two general groups of studies. On one hand, we have exploratory or descriptive studies. This type of studies is fundamental to understand new systems. Sometimes they receive a bad reputation, but data-driven research is largely based on these studies and should be just as rigorous. On the other hand, we have hypothesis-driven studies in which we have a specific hypothesis we aim to either support or disprove. Most real studies actually go back and forth between one approach and the other, but the distinction is fundamental to address the sample size problem. In the case of exploratory questions, a useful tool to determine sample sizes is via coverage targeting. Since we often have some information about abundance distributions of the subjects we are sampling in advance, we can target a specific level of coverage that is appropriate for both the objective of the study and the degree of resolution. In the case of hypothesis-driven research, power analysis is a well-established family of tools to determine sample sizes on the basis of an expected magnitude of the effect as well as a target type 1 and type 2 error tolerance. Let us note that much of the traditional views on hypothesis-driven research essentially follows some variation of Fisher's paradigm, as summarized here in Holmes and Huber. The research starts with a biological question from which she formulates a null hypothesis that contrasts with the alternative hypothesis. An experiment is designed to compare the two and it is then implemented for data collection, finally resulting in a p-value that leads to a conclusion. However, data science fundamentally breaks with this paradigm and much more closely follows Tukey's schema. In this alternative approach, Graphics, data exploration, and diagnostics occupy a central role in research, and the entire process is purported iteratively instead of linearly. Ultimately, whenever faced with the analysis of data, we need to first ask ourselves, what is this analysis for? There are many possible answers and many paths to those answers, but two notable poles reside on curve fitting and mechanistic modeling. When we have data in front of us, we can directly explore this data run curve-fitting exercises, or visualize it in different ways, all of these with the objective of generating new hypotheses with predictive power. In other words, we explore the data to build a model. However, we mustn't forget about the other half of the process, much more often overlooked in molecular data analysis. This model is now to be validated. Once a hypothesis is formulated, it must be tested. This is the process of mechanistic modeling a process that takes a model that could itself be derived from data or directly from first principles, generates predictions about the system it models, and then compares those predictions with actual data. This forms a virtuous cycle in which data and models interact to explain the world. 
As we have seen, data can be noisy, imprecise, inaccurate, but it ideally reflects some true properties of the natural system. In turn, models are incomplete, overly simplified representations of reality, and need to be adjusted and re-evaluated. As Norbert Wiener wrote, the best material model of a cat is another, or preferably the same cat. And as George Box wrote, all models are wrong. The practical question is how wrong they have to be to not be useful. Let us not forget that the quest for a perfect model is moot, because the whole point of models is to generalize and simplify reality to make it somewhat understandable and predictable. To continue this subject onto logical fallacies in data science and the concept of p-hacking, please continue by reading Fooling Ourselves by Regina Nuzzo and The Best Model of a Cat is Several Cats by Gustafsson and Valverdieu. To recap, we provided some general definitions and talked about data and metadata. We delved into the issues of data quality and sample coverage. We mentioned some aspects of study design and data collection. We talked about expectations and hypotheses. We contrasted the processes of curve feeding and mechanistic modeling and suggested some additional literature.